Welcome to Talking Pictures Trivia, the podcast in which a group of friends explore movies through trivia. I'm one of these friends, KJ, and with me is... Tom. I'm Chris. And Andy. For those joining us for the first time, we start off each episode with four rapid-fire trivia questions, and possibly a few bonus questions. Audience, feel free to play from home. The first question is worth one point, and each question after that is worth one more point. Then, we'll follow it up with our famous movie rant, Where Anything Goes. Tom, tell us about today's movie. Of the movies listed on the 1925 Japan movie list in Wikipedia, there is only one with a clickable link, which is today's movie... Orochi. So Orochi takes place in what we roughly can call the past, the Japanese past, the era of the samurai, in which our main character, um, Haisaburo Kuratomi, is a samurai working for a lord, and due to a collection of misunderstandings, he's gradually pulled further and further down the social ladder into the gutter. It seems to be this is caused by the fact that any slight whatsoever he addresses by attempting to beat up between 20 and 50 people at a single time. Mostly he's successful in doing this until the police come. And since this is his only reaction to anything, by the end of the film, he is completely destitute. Um, It is a moral story about how the wheels of power corrupt etc 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 it's not the morality of it isn't really that interesting what is interesting is to watch um suma soro buro bandu and i hope i'm pronouncing that correctly to watch this actor's physicality and his his ability with the sword and the fight scenes that he's at the center of um those are not always captured well due to the technology of the time but are certainly very impressive all the same. It's time for question one. When does the film take place? Locked in. Locked in. Locked in with a guess. I'm assuming that was part of the narration there. Maybe. Uh, KJ, what do you have as your guess? 1648. Okay. Uh, That's nice. Uh, Andy, what do you have as your guess? (laughs) I believe that the statement was the early 1700s in like a feudal town and chris what do you have i had also had 1700s no no specific date excellent yes there is no specific date it is the early 1700s excellent it's time for question two what does nami claim she doesn't care about and i mean she's the woman he is initially in love with locked in Locked in. It was a little bit hard. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I remember what she said she does care about, I think, but I'm trying to remember what she said she doesn't care about. All right, KJ. What do you have? Status? Okay. Andy, what do you have? Yeah, I said it was um, like money or, uh, yeah, like social status. Okay, Chris, what do you have? I, I'm the same place. It was like prestige, social status, like hierarchy. Okay, very good. I mean, she specifically says a man's background, but I think Mm. that's a translation, so I'm giving everyone the points. Well done. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yay! It's time for question three. What does the hotel clerk take Haziburu for? Locked in. Who? (laughs) (laughs) The main character. Did I say his name wrong? Oh, Got it, got it, got it. I'm, I'll <laughs> yeah. lock it. Said Boro? <laughs> yeah, or yeah. The hotel clerk at one point, I'll give you some context, stuff hits yeah. Kuratomi and uh, he goes to the proprietor or the clerk of the hotel and what does the clerk think? I do remember the scene. I think it was a brothel. That's why I was also kind of... Or, the, or a brothel. It's It's a little unclear. Man, I'm striking out tonight, Tom. Mm-hmm. All right, locked in. All right, what do you have, KJ? Um, someone delivering a message. Okay, uh, Chris, what do you have? Uh, towards the end of that scene, he tries to give him money because he thinks he's a thief, I believe, or or a, a, some some sort of ne'er do well. And Andy, what do you have? Yeah, like he thought he was like a a blackmailer or a 
yeah, a thief of some type. Definitely want definitely wanted money for nothing. Yeah. All right. So he actually says blackmailer. Um, I'm going to I'll give Chris and Andy the points just because thief blackmailer probably a trans. I said blackmailer. You did say it. Yeah. 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 But I'm also going to give Chris the points. Oh, yeah. You and Chris the points. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Even though you got the word correct, but I'm not going to I'm not going to be I'm not going to harp on that. He's got the edge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're at the fourth question uh, worth four points. Uh, it's six, six, two with Andy and Chris tied. But since this is a four point question, it is possibly anybody's game. It's time for question four. Kuratomi tells Lord Jirozu, quote, a samurai never forgets a debt, but neither will he. Uh, locked in. Locked in. And Lord Jirozu is the guy at the end. Yeah, the uh, the true villain. Mm -hmm. There was a there was a quote at the beginning of the movie. I think that was supposed to be him and um, Corey Tomi. Um, okay, locked in. I think. All right, KJ, what do you have? I think the end of that quote is something along the lines of "He will not do evil for his master." Okay, uh, Chris, what do you have? I'm going to say he won't lack honor. Okay, and Andy, what do you have? I thought it was like he um, he won't pay his debt with wrongdoing, or he won't pay his debt with violence or, or something like that. Okay, so the, the end of the quote is commit evil to repay it. Mm. Um, I think that Andy lands that. I think Andy and, and KJ landed, but consequently, I think Andy has the victory. Woohoo! Yeah. yeah well nicely done. done. Nicely mm -hmm. done. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's just me and Nick. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's my inspiration. <laughs> That's true for most of us. <laughs> <laughs> We're always just looking up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. The uh, I had the bonus question for you and Nick, but I think Ooh. it's a little too easy. Mm. Oh, let's let's uh, let's do some bonus questions before we move on to movie rant. They, they won't uh, count for anything. What what, what do you yeah. got? Yeah. Uh, how long was Kiritomi in jail for the second time? Oh, locked uh, in. Lock, locked in. No, uh, what'd you have? Two months. Technically, I okay. I think maybe he went to jail three times. And actually, the the second time he was only in jail for a few days after he got in like the bar fight. Otherwise, the last time he went to jail for like six months, and his uh, girlfriend got got married. <laughs> yeah, I was with Chris. I thought it was two months, but now that Andy was pointed out that there was three times, now I'm thinking Andy might be right. I thought the uh, breakout was the first one, but I don't know. Tom, uh, settle settle this up. It was six months. Only nice. Nick got it. Yeah. <laughs> it was three days for the first time six months and then i think he's sentenced to three years or something and he breaks out oh yeah maybe no, I, I don't remember the last i time. thought he broke out of the six month one maybe oh maybe it's the six month he broke out yeah either way he's in jail six months yeah. good or the other one was like um what is kurotami's criminal nickname but that should be easy mm. uh the, the outlaw i think mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, or at one point they call him uh Orochi, they call him a serpent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This just Outlaw was actually the original title of this, but it had to be changed because the censors worried that honoring an outlaw would be problematic for society. Well, I would like to congratulate Nick and Andy, our winners <laughs> this week. Cheers. Stay Woo! tuned for a silent but narrated movie rant coming up right after this break. Join another Talking Studios production, Limited Lexicon, where we play through text-based adventure games. Text-based adventure games were computer games from before computers had graphics. The game uses text to describe a scene, and the player types back how they want to interact with the game. I'll read the text from the computer, and my co-host will feed me commands. This season, we're playing through The Hobbit from 1982 on the ZX Spectrum. Here's a quick sample. I thought uh, a lot about our first command, and I think it should be 
no print because we don't want to print things as we're going along. I think by default, it's not going to print. And even <laughs> if I did, print, I, where is it going to print to? 1982? <laughs> I would imagine if we go west, we're going to be south of the troll, right? Just south of the troll land. Yeah, let's try it. You go west. The troll's clearing. The visible... Oh, <laughs> we died. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> All right. The troll, the troll saw us and killed us. So I think we have to see the answer to the riddle then. The answer is dark. Say dark, I think. Talk to what? Golem. Gollum. Say Gollum. Dark. You talk to Gollum. Thorin says, hurry up. And we died. What? And we died. So we went northeast last time. So let's go southwest. You go southwest. Visible exits are north, northwest. You see the valuable golden ring. Oh. Wow. Wow. Here. That's wait, wait, wait. perfect. Oh, That's wow. perfect. Wow. Limited lexicon. Coming to your podcatcher and YouTube in late 2022 by Talking Studios. And we're back. Audience, I hope you enjoyed Orochi. Um, it was a first watch for Chris and Andy and Tom. Um, my second watch. But Andy, you you were the most recent watch here. What are your thoughts on Orochi? I mean, I, I thought um, there are interesting things to talk about, like the filmmaking. Uh, but the regarding the story at the end they were like the narrator said something about now as we watch our hero something something i was like wait he's he's the hero <laughs> yeah. oh i i know he wasn't the villain but he's not really a great hero either i mean you know good heroes can be flawed too but uh he didn't really even have any redemption arc where he learned anything either <laughs> he just kept going down the the rabbit hole a little bit and um Honestly, the I don't know if this is might be controversial, but he reminded me of what modern day we would consider like an incel. Mm. It's like he's blames everything on the world, takes none of the responsibility on himself. He's <laughs> like, woe is me. Why is this a disaster? Well, he's he's like, I did nothing and it didn't work. I didn't try <laughs> to do change any of my methods whatsoever or just try to let anybody get to know me. Or try to back out of a dangerous situation and use any kind of rationality at all. He's just like, no, I'm going to fly up the handle, and that's that's what I do, and uh, the world is terrible to me. And, and nothing can change. Against my better judgment, I'm going to defend uh, Kuritomi here a little bit. So the first thing that happens to him wasn't his fault. His reaction was his fault, but... If he didn't react that way, it still would have been bad news because that higher class guy wasn't just offering him a drink. He was bored and wanted to tear down somebody lower. That right? one's the biggest catch-22 of all of them. Right? Like, there's so, not a great way to win that situation. Right. So that yeah. that's a tricky one. And then yeah. if he didn't – so then the next thing that happens is he overhears a conversation insulting his master. So if he didn't defend them and somebody saw that he was there and heard it and saw that he didn't defend the master, I also think there would be much more serious repercussions for that than we're imagining, right? So then the second one, he's also, in, from a certain perspective, being a hero because he's defending his master as a true samurai should, right? Even though that's not the results. And then I'm trying to think from there on, does each one of them have a, yeah, but... Or certainly he also saves um what's her name, Namae at the mm -hmm. end, right? That's another big That that's the mm -hmm. the most redeeming thing he did was was right. probably that. Yeah, he holds I, I agree with that. I also think you can you can make the case for him because he does have that redemption. Like he does kill a man at the very end. Like he doesn't kill anybody the entire film. And then when he does finally step over the line, he realizes yeah. he's gone too far and he lays the sword down immediately. So although not a hero. I think that is a heroic moment for him because he he realizes that what he has a co what he has done in his life has culminated in something that he never wanted. That it was on yeah. the precipice of, of villainy, of villainy or evilness. I agree with that. Yeah, he did pull back. He didn't go all the way down. He he pulled back right at the end. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I think if he was truly an evil villain or even a ne'er do well, uh, he would have continued killing everybody as he was going. He wouldn't have stopped at that moment. And it seems like the condemnation is also of the society in which they're in. 
I mean, he is not. Yeah, I mean, we could say that he has an almost like childlike behavior, but I think he's also, as KJ is pointing out, he's working within a social structure and he's operating properly in many of these instances by the the social system in which he's working. Yeah, the and etiquette. So the etiquette like of, word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that seems to be, um, we, we could say like he runs and grabs Naomi and like shakes her and, you know, that's a little, that's a little strange, right? That seems to be a little outside of the bounds. But um, otherwise, it seems to be somewhat, I don't know if the movie's revolutionary, but certainly brave in terms of pointing a finger at a, a social structure and saying this kind of conservative social structure results or can result in this. Uh, and so I think that's where a lot of the blame for what's happening is going in. It seems like a morality tale that's very different from, let's say, like medieval morality tales, where it's like the individual does wrong and yeah, needs I... to be forgiven. It's here, it's the society does wrong and makes a, a bad individual. I, I think this movie, this movie was good for like the first minute and the last minute. Because there was a really there were, they they actually repeated the quote twice. There was they were they had a quote in the beginning and a quote at the end. And I, I actually this is the I don't really put things in the show notes, but I actually wrote this one down. The quote was not all those who wear the name of villain are truly evil men. Not all those who are respected as noblemen are worthy of the name. And I feel like that one sentence is the entire movie that they took an hour to then try to explain through pictures and narration. Uh, but it's just kind of like poignant that he is a victim of his his society and and the social structure and the etiquette of the time and he goes down the wrong path but then he does kind of back up at the end when he realizes he's he stepped over the line did you ever read uh the native son or native son mm -hmm. yes no. it's a similar kind of story in a way i mean mm -hmm. focused on you know the behavior with uh with the woman in this case it's like He's forced into it a little bit weirdly. In that case, it was more, you know, she she had a different part in it. I don't think Naomi had the female characters in this movie didn't have much agency, which maybe is, you know, typical for 1925 in cinema. I, I th we should also point out that he does act appropriately in every situation he's in, even if he's working for a bad guy. So he's working for a bad guy. He still has that that respect for them, and that he does he does right by them. And then it's not until he realizes that the last guy, the true bad guy, what was his name? Sorry, the J, right? Um, Giroso. When he if realizes, that correct, but so, when yeah. he realizes that 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 guy is actually truly like above and beyond bad, he does stand up for what he believes in, and eventually takes the life of a, of a of an innocent. But I think yeah. the the most singular. Uh, thing that he didn't have a good reaction to i mean within the construct of who he was serving at the time yes but when uh Giroso kidnaps basically the woman that he loves i guess he kidnapped her he's like here now she's yours and he's like mm, okay maybe he was thinking about it real hard i mean obviously the scene in that movie was playing that up it's like the devil and the, the devil on your shoulder mm -hmm. and the, his conscience and he's conflicted but that that seems kind of cool too. Um, it's in a lot of video games. I don't know if you guys have played any like samurai type video games, but it's also often reconstructed in a, in a few different games that I've played. Um, uh, Masamura was one of them. Um, Five Alive. It happens. It, it's you're the guy with the swords, and you walk into a room, and there's someone in a, a kimono kind of on the floor like that. And it, it was interesting to see it in a film from 1925, knowing that it was that old of a trope that that happened in the video games do you are you asked to make a choice in that situation or is that just like a background of of kind of the story so so usually it's kind of a, a side room so you're not asked to do anything you're kind of like looking for treasure in a lot of video games right and you just happen to a room this room has a girl in a kimono you, you often can't interact with her or maybe you can sometimes they'll put a twist on it you walk up to her and then it becomes a boss and you have to fight a real samurai mm -hmm. with somebody in disguise. Sometimes it turns out they're a ghost and they fight you. So they, they kind of play with it a little bit. Interesting. Yeah. And in that scene, he ends up doing, because he's also caught in a double bind there, right? In that whole situation where he has to serve this Lord who's protected him. Um, but he now is going to have to serve his former Lord who he never forgets. Right? A samurai never forgets their, their obligation to their, to their master and so it becomes he's in a situation where he has two masters with contrary requests um 
it's almost as if the double bind manifests as <laughs> as kind of bad lust right <laughs> like like all those things combine in one place and he can't you know he has to kind of betray his own body or his body's betraying him mm -hmm. um so let's talk about the narration please how'd you guys how'd you guys feel about having a movie narrated to you i i I, I thought it was interesting, and I really liked how throughout the movie they were introducing who the actors were. Yeah, that was that was different. <laughs> yeah, the first the first time I heard it, the first time I heard it, I was like, Did they, "What? What just happened?" <laughs> <laughs> and then it happened a second time, and I was like, "They're really they're really telling you who's acting." And I it only really caught me because when we had discussed this movie, KJ, you had said that this was how it was presented in the cinema in the twenties was that there was a person actually narrating over the top of it. So it made sense at that moment. You know, it's almost like I'm watching a trailer for the film. This person mm. is telling me what's happening. Yeah. Oh, by the way, that person on the screen is so and so, the famous actor. And Tom Hanks says Jirozo Akagi. <laughs> yeah. And every time I wanted them to do a quick like '90s sitcom intro of that person, like a a, a turn to the camera and a smile, like a... <laughs> snap your fingers yeah. and point to the Little camera. Fourth, fourth yeah. wall break. Yeah. 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 I mean, this stuff, it's, yeah, the, the, the narrator is called a, a Binchi. We, we looked this up and the art of narration was called a Setsumi, which apparently predated, it goes all the way back to like the 1890s when you first had these films coming out. Um, and it was in, in like the 1920s where they started to try and actually stop doing it. And it used to be like, um, it used to be a whole team of people and they'd all be off off screen. So you just have this group. It was called a Kowaro Satsumi, which would do have several performers and be like four to six performers um, and be very colorful and lively. But with foreign films, it would be one performer who would just be very expository. They would just huh. say what it's about. And there's a something called the, the pure film movement in the history of Japanese silent films between uh, 1915, 1925. So this is coming at the very end of that. And in that time, that's when like the, they tried to get rid of Benchi, a lot of these filmmakers. Um, but what died out wasn't the Benchi, it was the group work. And so now you had single Benchi coming out of it. And it was that kind of thing. So in 1925, that's when like the golden age of Benchi happens. So Tom, that article saying, if they're going to watch um, Nosferatu or Phantom Carriage or The Man Who Laughs, they narrated it. Yes. Oh, yeah. You would narrate foreign films. You would narrate American That's silent wild. films. Yeah. And they would love, and these different Benchy became popular and actually became like, you would go to the theater with the Benchy you liked. Mm. Um, and they oh. would love the challenge of like, oh, I'm going to do Sunrise, you know, I'm going to do that, you know. <laughs> And be like, I'm gonna come up with oh, you know, the narration, narration for it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the narrator actually became one of the stars of the of the show, is what you're saying. Mm. Oh yeah. The narrator like was the star of the theater. And you could actually have like a different experience if you saw this movie in theater one with Benchy A versus it's if good. you saw it in that's like a house players. Yeah. 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 Oh, this is a D and D character in the making. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> narrating it's... the battle as it's going on. <laughs> I mean, the whole movie and with no dialogue obviously that's kind of unique but the idea of narrating the the inner mind of what's happening it's like that that tradition continues it reminds me of morgan freeman and shawshank redemption you know what i mean it's like it's like you you still get that it's just mixed in with then you know more traditional like dialogue scenes but um i like i mean when you um when you read and I'm like missing my literature here, but like when you're reading a thing in the third person or whatever, it's like you, I like getting to just know what somebody's thinking. I mean, that's a, that's a thing in, in movies that has to be indirect, you know, through dialogue and acting, except when, you know, just this magical voice can tell you what they're thinking, which I'll, is I'll, pretty nice. I'll, I'll bring my highfalutin literature uh, knowledge and say this is exactly what comic books do, that you can mm. you actually mm. get to see the thought bubble of what Batman is saying when he's sitting on top of the gargoyle. You know, he's a brooding character, doesn't say anything. You can have entire comics where he doesn't say a single line of dialogue, but they become very impactful because you're hearing what the character is thinking in that moment, mm. which is something that you can't do in a Batman movie, which is why some of them don't always work so well. Interesting. It seems like it was a rough job, though. I mean, you did apparently four to five shows a day, seven days a week. Oh, 
and they change the the movie about every week. So you had to come up with new stuff. All my yeah, life, I... I wanted to be a samurai. <laughs> <laughs> I, when they did the foreign, I mean, like when they made up the narration, they're making up, they're changing the movie. You know, like right. like they're adding interpretation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, on top of the movie, which is mm -hmm. like another performance, you know. I'd love to watch one of these. Like, yeah. And then I'm a. I, I wonder if there was a standard, right? The film and the film got to Tokyo. They standardized what the Benchy part was, and then distributed amongst Japan, right? I, I doubt the individual theaters would have had their own interpretation of a given movie. Oh, I thought they did. And I could be, I could be mistaken, but but I thought the Benchy were responsible for kind of coming up with what they were going to say. Even in the Japanese movies, then it wasn't the director that uh, wrote oh, I, down. I don't think so. I think it was that they were they were doing the work. Yeah, interesting. And of course, these films are made with the expe the Japanese films anyway are made with the expectation that somebody's going to do this. There will be Benchy. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's weird where there's no, you know, it's like actors always interpret. And and so you have different performances and directors reinterpret things. And so with like a stage play, it's always different, you know, but uh, you're always usually following the dialogue. So you have some base for it. But I guess that you and you just get to acting, you know? Yeah. I mean, you think of American silent films, a lot of the effort made in like uh, uh, Chaplin and Buster Keaton was how few subtitle intertitles can we use. That was the big thing. And they they actually had a competition with that. And so the idea was, can we tell the story without any any voice? Mm. Right. Mm. The, so the silent medium becomes an express, uh, it becomes a, uh, whatever, uh, uh, it becomes a means of showing their skill because the skill is, can we tell a story without words? Interesting. Here, it seems like the Benji, it's, can we tell the story with, can we differentiate? Can we give these characters um different voices um different inflections different emotions the interview keiji and i read um from midori sawato who was a she is, and currently is like one of the leading or is the leading benchi in japan and has been since the 70s um talks a lot about like her experience what she looks to do as a benchi um, and i believe she's the person who did this film so wait, wait, just to so you're living in Tokyo, your cousin's living in Osaka. You both go see the Patch on the Joan of Arc. Mm -hmm. You meet up. One of them, there's narration where the whole time Joan is just like, I shouldn't have done it. I shouldn't have done it. How am I going to talk my way out of this? I can't believe I did it. I shouldn't have talked my. Way. And then the other one is actually what happened in the movie where you know she believes she's doing what's God. You've watched two completely different movies. You can't have a rational conversation about the movie. It's like seeing Hamlet in two different places. I mean, there you can through the direction and the acting you can reinterpret you know mm. the subtlety of things certainly mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. yeah i think that's a good comparison it's the variation of of, of theater plays yeah, yeah. can i th throw in a really random aside sure yeah, but always. it's it's kind of relevant i uh saw patrick stewart last night oh really yeah he he wrote a memoir uh and so he's doing a book tour and he came to philly for his book tour and he was at the mm -hmm. kimmel center and oh. I love Star Trek, so I, Nora and I went to see Patrick Stewart, and he's telling stories about stuff. And uh, but he talked about spending 16 years in the Royal Shakespeare Company, mm -hmm. and then he talks about his his very first scene ever on Star Trek, mm -hmm. and he comes on and he didn't have any dialogue. He the whole scene is like he he's walking down the hallway and he has this Picard walk, and then like Riker comes out of the turbo lift and and he like gives them a look and and then walks off or something and uh, his story about it was that this all happened and he didn't have any dialogue and and then jonathan frakes who is like a big jovial guy it's like so that's what that british face acting is about <laughs> <laughs> it's all it's all in the face it's all <laughs> right there <laughs> yeah and, i mean maybe that's why this movie was so good because the guy that played cory tomey it was all in the face. It was, mm -hmm. yeah. It's it's also an interesting movie because um, there really seems to be a trend. It feels like a transitional movie. Just and when you read about the fighting, um, the, was, fast the fighting was fight, pretty cool. Yeah, the fighting was pretty cool. Uh, it, it's apparently very different from movies that came before it. 
mm-hmm. which were much slower and more stylized. And so this became sort of a samurai. This became a really important film in the history of cinema, samurai films, because the fighting style is so uh, kind of kinetic and fast. There's a lot of really cool, like flipping, mm-hmm. flipping guys over. Keisha, were you saying this is like one of the first samurai films? Is that why you had what were drawn to it? Is that true? Or am I making that up? No, I'm pretty sure this is one of the first samurai films, or certainly one of the most influential samurai films. Um, and I think you can see a lot of that on screen, right? I mean, a Kurosawa film has a lot more going on than um, Orochi, but still, I the DNA is there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this seems to have been invented in this movie, as far as I can tell. And then Probably. one last thing before we wrap up. The, the scene we were talking about earlier where um, Kuritomi is in the room with the, um, I think it's the waitress, actually. Um, yeah. Yeah. So... I thought, and this is going to be controversial, especially for 1925, I thought that scene was much more intense than the closet scene from Broken Blossoms. I think Lillian Gish could have learned a thing or two from from that <laughs> that scene there. <laughs> what do you think, Tom? This is, this is... Uh, but she doesn't turn in a complete circle. She does multiple times, and then the swords come in, and she's trying to... <laughs> I watched very carefully to, <laughs> to see, make sure she got the circle. At least a three sixty. I don't know if that's true, audience. <laughs> yeah. but it's I like, like the, okay. it's like each generation of snowboarders. They do a three sixty, and then it's the five eighty, <laughs> and then it just gets, yeah. yeah, yeah, it just gets more and more intense. That's what's happening between this Gish and this film. This yeah. yeah, yeah, they're they're well, Sean Whiting it. <laughs> audience, I'd like to once again congratulate our own Lillian Gish. Nick and Andy are winners this Woo. week. Yay. Well done. Mm. Thanks for nice. coming on, Andy. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was mm-hmm. nice. Definitely. A, I mean, expanding to just see something so different, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can rate and review this show anywhere podcasts are available. For those viewing in YouTube land, if you haven't already, please like this video. Subscribe to the Talking Studios channel for all our exciting content and follow us on Twitter at Talking Studios. Check out other shows by Talking Studios, including Keep Making Movies, where we explore micro-budget films, Limited Lexicon, where we play through text-based adventure games, and Get the Point, where we slowly reveal a movie poster and try to guess which movie poster it is. Got a question for us? Call the Talking Studios hotline at 201-467-8679 and leave a message. It may be featured on a future episode. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to Talking Pictures Trivia wherever fine podcasts are found. Join us next time when we discuss RRR from 2022. Stay tuned for our first er, 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 impressions of this film. Ding, 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 ding. Next week, we'll be discussing RRR from 2022. Chris, how was your watch? I'm not, I'm not going to even, I'm not even going to try to like slow play or, or undersell the, the headline here. I love this movie. This is the first, yes. this was the first Bollywood yes. movie I've ever seen. I never saw Slum Dog Millionaire, even though it was like critically acclaimed. Uh, I never had any reason not to watch them, but I just, I never did. And you know, KJ brought this one up. I, and I remember, I remember watching the Oscars last year when they got the the win for the for the song, and I was like, "Oh, that's that's interesting. That's cool." Still didn't watch it. I have no idea what the hangup was, but I loved every moment of this movie. And I think KJ, <laughs> at one point, you had texted us during the week, you know, that you were smiling as you were watching it, mm-hmm. and I definitely caught myself smiling <laughs> as I was watching this at least four or five times. If to be to be fair. If if I have to be critical of something, it is a little long. Three hours and seven yeah. minutes mm-hmm. is a is a little long for a movie, but I did do it in multiple sittings. And uh I I can't I mean it's it's got some heavyweight material to it. Like it's got some heavyweight kind of get you in the feels moments, but they they do it in such a way that it's still kind of fun and fanciful and there's music and songs and dancing in a story about India occupied by England. And it was I really, really enjoyed it. I I didn't know that I was going to enjoy it when when KJ said it, but 
man, was it awesome. <laughs> KJ, what about you? How was your first watch or for this watch? Oh, Chris, I also love, love, love this movie. Um, like you, my introduction was that song. So the, they announced the nominees for best song. There was five of them, something from Top Gun, maybe. Um, and this one, and this one I played over and over and over again. So I'm like, you know, what? I'm going to watch this movie. So I started it on Netflix. I put it, I set it to Hindi, but then I realized it wasn't recorded in Hindi. I usually like to watch movies in their native tongue. So then I set it to English and I, it just, I, it was, it was not easy to watch. Um, but luckily one of the theaters in Philly was playing it. So I said to my wife, Rachel, Hey Rach, let's go down and watch this movie. Cause they were going to have it in Telu. It was one of the greatest movie theater experience I've ever had. The, crowd was so into the movie they cheered when our heroes did the right things they jeered literally when the the villains were were successful it was awesome fell in love with the movie i listened to the soundtrack i don't know 50 times a million times um i watched it again for 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 this show i like chris said big smile on my face i'm so excited to hear what you guys have to say about it i loved it audience just get out there watch it um like Chris said, maybe do it in a few settings. There is an, an actual intermission, so if you want to take a break then, that's probably not a bad idea. How about you, Tom? What are your first impressions? Sorry, it's Telugu. Is it Telugu? Yeah. Audience, I've been saying Telugu. It's Telugu. I need to educate myself. I had a college professor who's also a theater critic, and for some reason, somebody had this this person review the ABBA musical Mamma Mia. And he wrote that trying to review this <laughs> would be like trying to review the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Um, and that was my experience with this movie. Trying to like think critically about this movie would be like trying to think critically about a, an amusement park ride. It's just a collection of scenes that are really fun and really exciting, be it a, a dance number or one of the action numbers. The movie has many action numbers. It has multiple dance numbers, which are a delight. The movie is completely lacking in any kind of what we call hipster irony, right? It's, it's playing every emotion straight. And though it is dealing with historical trauma and pretty severe historical trauma, in very, very violent terms. It is not shy in its depiction of violence. Yet the movie feels like a collection of events or a collection of happenings. It's just, it has no tolerance for realism. It wants the most extreme and almost silly thing to happen without commenting or winking at us that something silly or extreme is happening. And so to talk about this movie being a good movie or a bad movie seems like the wrong conversation to have. It's a collection of exciting events, much like a, a, a theme park is a collection of exciting events. And what's I think fascinating about that, that idea or that way of contextualizing historical trauma is that, um, is that they're framing what was a really cruel period in, in this country's history in these terms. And it, it's really actually reminds me a lot of Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards, mm, um, who does yeah. something very similar. Mm -hmm. Quentin Tarantino actually, in a few of his movies, Inglorious Bastards, um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and also Django Unchained is kind of looking back on something horrible in history and recontextualizing it in kind of a silly or maybe somewhat goofy way in order to have some sort of authority or ownership of something that is otherwise tragic. Um, and I think this movie is doing that too, although everything is dialed up to 11. RRR is available on Netflix at the time of this recording. And like Tom said, audience, it is a very violent movie. So heads up for that as well. Wow, Talking Studios, 